which is that this system that was designed to harm black people was also designed to help white people. White people benefit from mass home ownership and easy access to credit, higher education, and a criminal justice system that protects rather than harms them on average. And the reason we don't often think of it this way is that white people are taught not to think of ourselves as even having a race. Oh, everyone else has a race, but not us. We are the regulars, the default. <laughs> but it's bullshit. The system of racial hierarchy we live under does assign us a race. It just gives us a benefit for having that race. And what we as white people almost never do is confront those benefits. Ask, what are they? And how do we feel about them? And what Racism yeah. often is in, gives advantages to white folks. And it's part of the conversation we almost never have. I mean, even white Americans who are sympathetic to the issue of racism are aware of it. You know, it's like, oh, my God, that's so terrible how black people are treated, da, da, da. You know, they they read the right books. They watch the right movies. Uh, you know, Michael Keaton knocks down the sign off the wall. Or was, or was it Kevin Costner? Who was it in Hidden Figures? He knocks off the bathroom sign. Do you remember this? Right. <laughs> this it's is like, Kevin Costner. Right? It's Kevin Costner. Down the sign. It's a great he moment, right? He, like, yeah, he pulls down the sign. Oh, he fixed racism forever. Oh, my God. I found out racism exists. Let me fix that for you. Bang. Knock the sign down. We did it. Hooray. That's that's so many white people's experience of uh, of what racism is in America. Um, but even folks who are maximally thoughtful about it almost never think about race in relation to themselves as white people. And in fact, a lot of white people have a revulsion or a resistance to thinking of race as even something that they possess or a label that would be applied to them. Um, so I, I, you know, have you felt that resistance throughout <laughs> your life? And where do you think it comes from? Uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely certainly, you know, I don't come from a lot of money and I went to a private university. So I, I feel like particularly in college, right, I would be like, but what? What did I get for being white? Right. Particularly because the way we would talk about racial privilege would be about the experience of very affluent white people. Right. Yes. And so I would sort of be like, what did I ever get for being white? Right. Like, that's crazy. And then, you know, you, you get some more experience in the world and you understand like, oh, it works really differently for people who aren't white. And for me, like the project of doing the sort of studying of the white bonus was kind of like, well, if we even take away these sort of soft privilege things that we talk about and instead just focus on like dollars and cents, maybe I'll learn something that's helpful. Yeah. So what do you what is the concept of the white bonus is the title of the book? What do you mean by that? Right. So the white bonus is the amount of money um, that you've gotten because of racism when you're a white person. Right. Oh, and I get the check every year. It's awesome. Yeah, I know. We I, all get a direct check. Right. No. <laughs> uh, no. I mean, yeah. Well, uh, well, I have not received such a check. So what do you mean by that bonus? Right. So the way that I measure in the book um, is I say, OK, well, how much money did I or the people that I was profiling in the book, how much have we gotten from our families since we left home? And how hmm. likely is it that our families would have had that money to give us if they weren't white, right? So that just means going back through each family's history and the events in the person's life and saying, okay, like, just how likely is it, right? Like, this is not, I'm not proving this at the level of social science. I'm not sort of proving it in a courtroom, but just sort of going, all right, well, you know, for me, for example, you know, when my grandfather passed away, I inherited $25,000. That was really helpful for me at the time. Now, this is not the kind of money, right, that a lot of my classmates at the private university are getting from their families, right? It's much mm -hmm. smaller. But for me, it was significant. And, you know, then go, okay, well, how did my grandfather have that money, right? Well, he worked as a banker in mid-century America, right, at a time when, you know, when he went into banking in 1930, in the entire country, there were only 80 Black bankers, right? and so. Pretty much, right, he had that job because he was white in part. Mm -hmm. And then also, right, he bought a house in the 30s that had a racial covenant on it. So if he had been mm. a black person, he would not have legally been allowed to leave in that, to live in that home and to build the wealth that he had right through that house. So I think, you know, when I started looking at my white bonus, I was like, well, like, it's pretty clear, like any money from that grandfather, right? That's tied to his being white. And I didn't do anything to make that the case, right? But I'm still benefiting from it. Yeah. I, I also think sometimes, even if you haven't received a check like that, that there's a more invisible form of getting that money. I mean, I 
I never in my 20s, after I graduated college, received a check from my parents for any reason other than a birthday gift. And, you know, sometimes the birthday gifts are, you know, not insignificant, but, you know, whatever. That's it's uh, uh, so I guess I did receive money. Never mind. I take it back. I guess I did get some checks because they were birthday gifts. What am I talking about? Why would I have left that out? That's what it's so strange the way we think about money. OK, but what? apart from the birthday <laughs> gifts, right, right. Let's let just let's just pretend I never got those. Um, I, you know, I, I remember realizing, well, hold on a second. Uh, I went to college. I, I have no debt. Right. My parents are able to provide that for me. And also, I know that if something were to go wrong, I would have my folks to fall back on. You know, early in my 20s, I decided I was going to quit my job as a web developer and do comedy full time. And I was luckily able to make a living doing that, doing freelance jobs, video editing, stuff like that, while I did the comedy until I could finally make a living at it. But why did I feel OK to take that risk? It was because, well, if things go really bad. You know, my my parents will help me out. You know, I, I can go visit them on Long Island and stay in their stay in their bedroom or whatever it was. Right. And I, and I had friends who in comedy who genuinely didn't have that cushion. I were people around me who came from immigrant families who who didn't have that sort of resources, for instance. And then the college itself or why were my parents able to send me to college? Well, they were both college professors themselves or uh, had had uh, Ph.D. degrees and were educators. Why did they have that? It's because my mom's dad. Uh, was a World War II veteran, bought a home on the GI Bill uh, and benefited from the huge, you know, influx of cash given to cash and support given to uh, that generation. Right. Um, and, you know, he lived in uh, Michigan, upper Michigan at the time. Um, plenty of people lived in Michigan, I think, who did not get that help from the federal government buying a home, et cetera, et cetera. So regardless of the check, there's this whole basis of stability that uh, came from multi-generations of middle-class stability granted to my family by the by specific policy decisions on the part of you know state, local governments, federal government uh, that not everybody had access to. That's correct. I mean, so the GI Bill and the New Deal are really strong examples of how advantage to white folks has been baked into American policy and sort of sort of social, how do I say, uh, social equity, right? Mm -hmm. And so with the GI Bill, most of the education benefits were used by white folks. Um, the way that they administered that program, right? you could sort of make the decisions about the GI Bill at the state level, right? So most Black people mm. at the time in the U.S. lived in the South. Mm. And so the local administrators in the South, right, could decide you do or you don't get that. Same thing with the housing. And some, this was in the mid-50s that they right, were making these decisions. Right. And the same thing with housing, right, and sort of the mortgage guarantees as well, like under the GI Bill, right? And so you both had that as well as most of the institutions of higher education in the South were still segregated, right? Yeah. And so you didn't have sufficient capacity to educate all the folks that wanted to get educated, right? Yeah. And so that's a huge thing that I think disappears for a lot of white folks, right? Because it's, you know, your grandpa or your great grandpa. Um, but it really has a, a different effect um, depending on your race. Yeah. I mean, what you're talking about is intergenerational wealth, is it not? I mean, we often think of wealth as being what Bill Gates has or Elon Musk has, but, you know, we're talking about resources that families are able to grow and, and pass down over time that were, to some extent, given to them by policy choices, right? Absolutely. I mean, middle class stability is something that government created. And when mm -hmm. government created it, they essentially restricted it to white people. I had no idea that, you know, the GI Bill, such a famous bill that granted middle class security was, you know, so segregationalist -y. That's not a word. You know what I mean? <laughs> was, was was discriminatory in that way. I mean, what other policies, you know, uh, created this? Right. So in addition to the GI Bill and FHA, right, you had just general housing discrimination, right? So we had racial covenants sort of declared unconstitutional in 1948, but discriminating against people on the basis of race for housing didn't become illegal until the Housing Rights Act in 1968, right? So mm. you have all that time before you could actually, like, as a Black person, go in and be like, no, you can't actually tell me I can't live here because of my race, right? So all those generations, all those decades of building wealth and stability, right, get left out. And so that's um, that's really important. Higher education, right? Also hugely important, particularly because you had so much segregation in it early on when it was affordable. So I think this is something really important. 
And Heather McGee touches on it somewhat in her book, Some of Us. But, you know, with the GI Bill, most of the people getting to go to college, it was covered, right? It was just free. You could just go to college because you had the GI Bill. When you get to the boomer generation going through college, then it's a little more expensive. Like you might need a part-time job over the summer to cover some of the tuition, right? But the states are still chipping in a lot of money for it, right? And at the time, right, only a few more people of color are university, right? So GI Bill, it's almost only white people outside of HBCUs, right, that are in universities. Then you have the boomer generation, the little bit less white, still pretty affordable. You get to my generation, Gen X. Now you kind of got to work full time during the summer and half time during the school year to get through, but you'll probably have, you'll probably have some debt when you get out. Right. And so that's as like the amount of people of color coming into the educational population, right, is increasing. And now, right, as we're getting a more and more integrated higher education population, right, you don't get out of college, right, without mortgaging your future unless your family can pay for it. I was lucky that I had no debt. I consider that to be like a great gift that I had. Whereas 70 years ago, everyone going to college was like, yeah, who who has debt? I mean, like we all went for free, right? Or at least the vast... The vast majority did. I I never even thought until you pointed this out of combining these two trends. A, that, you know, in the 50s, higher education was whites only. Like, you know, if black people were going to the college, it was either a special institution that was founded specifically for that purpose, of which there were only a handful, or they were escorted by the National fucking Guard, (laughs) right? In order to to cross the gates of that university. Um, To now, we have a much better, you you know, uh, uh, admissions is far more race blind than it used to be, and, and people of all races go to colleges. To not a perfect extent, but obviously it happens now, it didn't before. To combine that trend with the trend that, hey, 70 years ago or so, university was free and now you have to you have to pay hundreds of thousands, you put yourself hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt to go. Holy shit, as college became more inclusive, it also became more expensive simultaneously, such that basically just white people of our grandparents' generations went for free. Now, uh, black people couldn't go. Now that black people can go, it's super expensive to go. I I never thought of those two trend lines are going in opposite directions at the exact same time. Yeah, I mean, there's really interesting political research about this too, right? So um, mm. in the 1950s, um, and I have not memorized these statistics, but in the 1950s, the majority of white voters supported the idea that government was supposed to help and that everybody would need help sometime and, and sort of sort of a broad support for things like the New Deal, where government was seen as an agent to help you and you, you would pay taxes and you would get something back for it. Right. As soon as our sort of body politic and people in higher education, as soon as that began to be integrated, white support for this idea of a collective sort of government response plummeted. Yeah. Right. It just went way down. And then you see the rise of Reagan and Nixon and, you know, that all this stuff that sort of sets up where we are today. Uh, I mean, we covered this on my show, The G Word. It's one of the most like important facts about the 20th century that as soon as government help, government assistance of any kind started being given to more than just white people, white people started going, it's wasteful. We got to stop giving it out. Look at the, look at these bad people getting the government money. And then, you know, uh, the, the age, the new deal age of governments helping people buy homes, go to college, all the sort of supports that our grandparents had and that we don't have started being taken away specifically because suddenly they were going to black. I mean, the most obvious example of this is I've brought up on the show before, uh, what happened to public pools that, you know, there used to be public pools all across America, what happened when, you know, a pl- very important place that was desegregated was public pools. The white people closed the pools down and they started putting them in their backyards and country clubs instead. And now, like, I dare you to find a public pool in America in a place that is not, you know, still consistently super white. Right. Um, and, and that that is sort of uh, you can look at almost the entire history of 20th century America through that lens. But it's one of those things that's in that's invisible. Until you actually bring bring it up and and talk about it, yeah. I mean, I think for me, working on the book, book, I was really surprised at just how consistently white people sort of are like, well, everything and it can be generous if it's 
for us. But the second that we, right, and individual overall, with people in the I think recently, increasingly, we actually do need some kind of help from government to be able to afford housing, right? To be able mm-hmm. to afford health care. And these are all ideas that we've sort of allowed politically to buy into this idea that, well, we have to make sure people really deserve this, right? And whenever uh-huh. you hear about people need to deserve this, usually what we mean in the U.S. is, well, we want to make sure that Black people aren't going to get this because we're worried about whether or not they would really deserve it, even though it'd be fine, right, if white people were the ones intended to get it. And then there's this weird metastasization of that idea, right, where you start getting this more and more punitive system. You normalize the idea that you're supposed to constantly be proving whether or not you deserve stuff. And then just that's how the system works. And now that we've let capitalism get so much more aggressive and unfettered, where people do need more help, what we have is this really punitive system, right? Yeah. So increasingly, like white people are caught up in that as well. Yeah, it, it ends up hurting everybody. Uh, I, I mean, if you're I'm sure there's plenty of white people listening to this show, perhaps thinking, well, hold on a second. I was not helped out that much by the federal government. Well, you might want to ask yourself, were your grandparents helped out by the federal government? And then did your grandparents generation then slowly over time want to stop supporting those policies and take them away from everybody? And could that be why your state, you know, your your parents went to your the state university for free or for very cheap. But for you, it was 20 grand a year or whatever it was Um, like that's. We we our entire generation is the victim of this trend, probably less so white people than everybody else, but it's affecting yeah. everybody. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot. You know, I grew up in rural Michigan and went to a public high school. And you know, when I was graduating in the nineties, you know, a lot of my classmates were like, "Why would I go to college? I can just like walk out the door and go work at Ford or GM." Mm-hmm. And I'm going to be perfectly fine. I don't need a fancy life. I don't need to go study a bunch of stuff. I just want to like live and have a family. And you could do that, right? And, then, you know, so there was really this sort of public, private, like social contract across the Rust Belt for those communities where if you wanted to just have a basic life, you weren't necessarily ambitious about doing some grand thing out in the world, but you just wanted to go and support a family, you could do that for free, right? And you didn't yeah. have to go into debt to finish high school, to get into the factory. And now, right, we've sort of bought into this economy where you are supposed to have this very high level of education just to get to the point that like my grandfather got into in the 40s, right, with very little education, right? Yes. was able to support like a, like three children and a wife and send two kids to college. I mean, it's I think all the time about, again, you know, my my mom was raised Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Her grandfather, uh, my grandfather was a you know World War Two veteran, didn't go to college, had some vocational training, became a manager at AT&T, worked that job for the rest of his life, died a millionaire, a single digit millionaire, you know, because of wise investments and the housing market and all the things you were supposed to do. Um, and, you know, my my part of the family 